Hello and welcome to Inside Iraq. I'm Jasim Azawi. When Norway's most respected financial newspaper, Dagens Neringsliv, covered the activities of a small Norwegian oil company called DNO, operating in northern Iraq, no one expected subsequent investigations to implicate the former U.S. politician Peter Galbraith. Ambassador Galbraith is now suing DNO for a quarter of a billion dollars because the Kurdistan regional government has squeezed him out of his 5% stake in the oil company. What is more devastating for Iraq is the role Mr. Galbraith played as a political consultant to the KRG in writing Iraq's constitution in a way that can only be described as a potential ticking bomb. This story has all the marks of dual loyalty, betrayal, and international intrigue. It was only a few weeks ago that former U.S. diplomat Peter Galbraith was discharged from his role as the U.N.'s second highest ranking official in Afghanistan. The dismissal was issued after Galbraith claims that his boss had covered up fraud in the country's recent elections, allegations that were vehemently denied. Now, in a separate case of alleged corruption, the accuser has become the accused. The allegations relate to another of America's theaters of war, Iraq, but once again they are vehemently denied. A former staff member of the U.S. Senate Committee on Foreign Relations and the U.S.'s first ambassador to Croatia, Peter Galbraith maintains a special interest in ethnic minorities. Even after resigning from the U.S. government, he was a vocal advocate of an autonomous Kurdistan, a case he championed in his book, The End of Iraq. And he claims he advised Kurdish leaders seeking to secure ownership and control of the region's oil resources during discussions over the Iraqi constitution in 2005. Yet he now stands accused of having had a vested interest in Kurdish independence. On the 10th of October, a Norwegian business newspaper printed allegations that Peter Galbraith's company, Porcupine LP, had business dealings with Norwegian oil company DNO. The article stated that, in secret, senior diplomat Peter Galbraith has economic interests in a Kurdish oil field. DNO was the first to strike oil in Iraq's northern Kurdish region. The Norwegian company now owns a major stake in Kurdish oil field Tauke. In June this year, the company began exporting this extremely profitable resource, signing contracts with international companies, despite objections from Baghdad. It was only after recent delays in its operations that the links between DNO and Peter Galbraith surfaced. Galbraith has denied any wrongdoing, and there is no suggestion that he has done anything illegal. He has admitted to having a contractual relationship with DNO, but insists that there was no conflict of interest between his business activities and consultations with the Kurdish government. But rights to oil revenues remain a key sticking point in negotiations between the central government in Iraq and the KRG, with foreign ownership at the heart of the matter. And foreign ownership of the region's oil fields is perhaps the most controversial element of all. Nashwa Nasreddin for Inside Iraq. I am now joined from Oslo by Terry Erikstadt, a financial news editor at Norwegian business daily Dagens Naringsliv, and from London by Sabah Al Mukhtar, president of Arab Lawyers Association in London. And we were also supposed to be joined by Mohammed Ihsan, Minister for Extra Regional Affairs of the KRG. But unfortunately, we were informed at the last minute that he fell sick and cannot join the program. Sabah and Terry, welcome to Inside Iraq. Terry, let me start with you. Were you surprised to discover that the name of Mr. Peter Galbraith, the former U.S. ambassador to uh, Croatia and a leading figure in Washington, he had a 5% stake in the DNO? Yes, indeed. We were very much surprised because it all started with a Norwegian company being fined by the uh, Oslo Stock Exchange. And uh, we started working on this case as an ordinary uh, conflict between a company on the stock exchange and the stock exchange. And it ended up with Peter Galbraith owning uh, uh, oil interest or having oil interests in Kurdistan. That was very surprising for us, indeed. Sabah? Who is Peter Galbraith? Set the situation for us. Galbraith is a, is a professor of uh, international politics in, in the USA. He was a, an ambassador in a variety of capacities in Croatia and Afghanistan. He was advisor to the U.S. government. He's a man who was being paid a salary by the government of the United States of America. He was at the same time being paid 
a salary by the Kurdish government as an advisor. And at the same time, he was taking money from a company which is going to apply for oil in, in Iraq. He has uh, been instrumental in uh, assisting the Americans and the Kurds to produce a constitution for Iraq, which is a designer-make country, which is a failed state, to install a government and a regime there that has been looking after the interest of, uh, of Mr. Galbraith. And this reminds us and reminds the listeners and the viewers that this is again the history repeating itself. In the past, there was a Mr. Golbenkian, Mr. 5%, during the Ottoman Empire, who had 5% of the oil of Iraq. And now we have this man having a 5% interest in the Kurdish uh, area in Tawuk field in particular. But now he, they seem to have turned the table on him. That's why he's on an arbitration cause with them. If that is the case, Terry, explain to me how come in a very lengthy explanation and justification by the Minister of Natural Resources of the KRG, Mr. Ashti Horami, on the website of the KRG.org, he mentioned it all, what happened, the genesis of the story of DNO and its operations in Kurdistan for almost five, six pages. And yet, the name of Peter Galbraith has not been mentioned even once. How do you explain that? Because uh, Peter Gelbert was a secret partner uh, with the Norwegian company, uh, you mentioned uh, DNO International. And uh, this company had two secret partners in their uh, exploration in Kurdistan. Uh, it, uh, the, the interest of Mr. Galbraith was hidden behind a company, na company named Porcupine. And this porcupine is incorporated in uh, one of the states of uh, the USA, Delaware. And uh, it was very difficult to know about his identity. We found it through um, uh, the company registry. And uh, it was all hidden. It was. Um, um, it's, he's in a conflict with the DNO uh, because. Uh, the, uh, the Kurdish government did not recognize his interests when uh, the new oil law was applied to this uh, uh, field, the Toke field in Kurdistan. And he is now in an arbitration process with DNO. Uh, and it was all kept secret until we found out the, the, the identity of the company in this arbitration process and the man behind it. Mr. Galbraith. Uh, the, the Kurdish government say that they know nothing about it, but that's very difficult to understand. Indeed, it is very difficult to understand, Sabah al Mukhtar. If you were Peter Galbraith, here is a man who spent the better part of almost four years consulting and advising the KRG. He shepherded them through the lengthy process of the constitution writing. He inserted some very important clauses to the benefit of the KRG regarding the relationship between Baghdad and Erbil, regarding the oil law, regarding the Peshmerga, regarding their territorial authorization. And yet, at the very last moment, they squeezed him out and they crossed him. And the 5% that he was banking on never materialized. Well, I think uh, this is what uh, you have a, when you have a dispute between the, th the 40 thieves of Baghdad, that's what you end up with. You end up with disclosures that I think this is going to run a little more. Uh, Galbraith at the present moment has a problem with the uh, KRG, but I think within the KRG itself there are a variety of individuals who may have interest, vested interest, who may have conflict of interest, and that is part of the problem. But to go back to what Galbraith did, in the Constitution he is the one who has instigated the idea that a federation is set up in Iraq, but based on ethnicity, which is not the concept of federal government. He has in, uh, encouraged the Kurds and insisted on having the local government having priority over the federal government. He has given the local government the final say. He's given the oil rights to the uh, regional government rather than the federal government. He has uh, assisted them in drafting a constitution which by any stretch of imagination could not be accepted as a proper constitution to the extent that there is Article 142 of the constitution which called for a revision and a review of that constitution within four months, which until now they have failed to do. He, uh, he assisted them in working on the idea what's called the land grab 
i.e. taking areas which were not within the regional government of Kurdistan to be part of Kurdistan so that he can have the oil. He has encouraged them to have the, uh, 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 the type of contracts that he signed with them. But then subsequently, the problem between the federal government and the regional government stopped that contract from going on. And I think for reasons which I don't know, uh, there is, they, they have fallen out. Having uh, uh, paved the way for them to set up this uh, arrangement, he now stands to lose the money. But I think he's a man who has been working on conflict of interest on a variety of levels, from the USA to Iraq to the politics to the uh, Kurdish uh, uh, government, and at the same time working for a company which is going to contract with the Kurdish government. And this is an extreme case of conflict of interest, which I think it tantamounts to an illegal act, but this is a matter for the U.S. to deal with. Terry, you've been after Mr. Galbraith. Uh, you've been trying to reach him. You talk to him every now and again. Your newspaper reported on some of the conversation with him. The paparazzis are hounding him in Bergen. And he, he mentioned something that your newspaper uh, quoted, says, this dog is very aggressive, meaning that he is not a, an easy person to deal with. You know, he is liable to spill the beans. What is it that he can come up with that so far has not been revealed? Uh, that's very difficult to say, but but uh, he has not been cooperative with us at all. He he didn't want to speak about it, uh, his interests. Uh, he uh, wanted to flee away when our journalists uh, met him. He has not returned our calls or uh, answered our uh, our um, emails. Uh, but he has acknowledged that he has a an economic interest uh, or uh, economic conflict, I have to say, with this Norwegian company, the DNO International. He rejects that they have a direct interest in the oil fields. And he, it's, it's very unclear how he got this interest, uh, which he claims he have uh, regarding uh, the, or uh, towards DNO. Because we know that the judge in this arbitration process going on in London has concluded that Mr. Galbraith has a legitimate uh, claim on DNO, and it's regarding the oil field, Tokyo. So in one way or another, he has this economic interest. And it's very unclear for us that who gave him this interest. Was it the That being the uh, case, Terry, let Kurdish us government? move to the second uh, person in this story, the Minister of Natural Resources, Ashti Horami. In mm. his lengthy explanation mm. that I alluded to on the website of krg.org, he mentioned that everything he has done was with the knowledge and the consent of the Prime Minister at the time of uh, Nechirvan Barzani, as well as with the knowledge of the current Prime Minister, Barham Saleh. Explain to me what is the role of Ashti Horami. Yeah, that's very interesting because the story actually started with uh, the Minister of uh, Natural Resources. Because uh, what happened was that he, on behalf of the government, did buy shares in this Norwegian oil company. Uh, but it, uh, it was all hidden. It was not revealed to the market or to the stock exchange that this uh, minister had, uh, on behalf of his government, um, bought these shares. And when it was revealed, um, it became a big story in Norway, because uh, it is now in no doubt that this is of a big interest for uh, both the stock exchange and investors. Because, as you will know, DNO, uh, the biggest uh, asset of DNO is actually the oil fields in Kurdistan. And, of course, when the minister uh, buy shares on behalf of the government in that company, that's of uh, big interest for, uh, for uh, investors, as I said. And when we revealed that uh, it was uh, his uh, ministry that was behind uh, this uh, transaction. Uh, the Kurdish government actually tried to punish uh, DNO, uh, the, the company, and uh, they alluded to that uh, they, they may be uh, thrown out of Kurdistan without any compensation uh, because this information has been revealed. 
And the big, big question is, uh, this transaction gave a huge, a very, very big um, sum of money, and we don't know where the money has gone. It was a well, big... Well, that will be revealed uh, later on, Terry, but meanwhile, let me go back to Sabah. If there was any indication, Sabah, the KRG as well as Mr. Ashti Horami and even Peter Gabbard should have realized that there is no oil law. There is no oil, new oil law. It is still in discussion in Parliament. And eventually Baghdad is going to put its foot down and say these contracts are illegal. That's exactly what the current Iraqi oil minister, Hussein Shahrastani, did. So did, didn't they realize that they are going to hit a brick wall? This is precisely, is precisely the situation. You are quite right. In the first instance, there, since there is no oil law at the present moment, any uh, agreements that are signed between any government, whether local or federal, with oil companies in the absence of the law will be illegal. It's contrary to the existing laws. This is number one. Number two, the federal law supersedes or should supersede the local law of Kurdistan. But at the present moment, the Kurdish government have gone ahead and signed contracts with DNO and other companies. This is the mad gold rush of the USA at that time. They have thought that they can sign contracts now, get the oil, but then the landlocked land of Kurdistan, you would need to use the facilities of the federal government. When some oil was exported from the north through the pipelines of the government, the government took the, the, uh, the revenues of the oil, and now they, the Kurdish government has stopped export because they wanted the federal government to pay to the oil companies. The federal government said, we do not know what agreements you have with these companies. We do not know what amounts are due, on what basis, etc. All these reasons, these are the practical reasons and the legal reasons. But I think part of the problem is that within the Kurdish region government, there are individuals who are involved in these deals. And there are conflicts between the various members of the government there over these various oil deals. It's not only DNO. DNO because it's the one which came actually to fruition. There are other contracts which have been signed and there was a lot of pay handouts and uh, uh, back payment to, to people and there are conflict between the variety of Speaking people about and certainly there is a conflict between the region and the, and the federal. Uh, Abdul, Abdul Hadi Al Hassani, who is a leading member of the Oil and Gas Committee within the Iraqi uh, Parliament, has called for investigation about the ownership and trading of Mr. Ashti Horami in DNO. Is this going to be just another layer of tension between Baghdad and Erbil Sabah? No, this is not. The, the tension is much deeper than that. The present moment, the government in Kurdistan do not answer in any way to the government in Baghdad. They are something like an independent state, and that is thanks to Mr. Galbraith. He has set out a constitution which has divided Iraq. He's been a, a, an ardent supporter of dividing countries. He's done this in Croatia. He, he was trying to do this in Afghanistan. He was the man who propagated the idea of dividing Iraq into three states, from which Biden came I believe to he has a book that uh, called scenario. The End of Iraq. Absolutely. This is, this is the book, and this is the book that actually, if anybody accuses others of being people who, can, who are uh, fond of conspiracy theories, they should read this book to actually see the conspiracies that were actually being done. I don't mind uh, promoting this book. Perhaps Mr. Garbreth would get a few more dollars for it. But this is exactly what has been Marketing done. Marketing aside, Sabah Al-Mukhtar, let me go to Terry. Terry... You and your newspaper are the very enemy of KRG. The Norwegian media is the very enemy of the KRG. That is how Mr. Ashti Horami put it in his uh, lengthy justification and explanation. Do you in the media in Norway have something specific against the KRG and Mr. Ashti Horami? Why is he after you? No, I can assure you and I can assure the Kurdish people and the people of Iraq that our uh, uh, newspaper has nothing against uh, the people of Iraq. Of course not. We, uh, I'm, a, I'm a financial news editor. This started as a business story. It was a f big fine given by the uh, Oslo Stock Exchange to a Norwegian company. And we just tried to find out why did the company 
uh, get this fine. And we found out it was because they have hidden uh, the identity of KRG and Mr. Havrami uh, and his role in this uh, transaction. Uh, and I think the the government of the Kurdish people owe to the people to account to to tell them where have the money gone. It's unaccounted. More, let's uh, around 15 to 20 million dollars, which is totally unaccounted for. Uh, the explanation given by the authorities was that this uh, money has gone to a private company owned uh, by a Turkish citizen. I think if that's correct, that's quite astonishing uh, how the company uh, or, or the government of Kurdistan is willing to give away the oil money to, uh, to other uh, private uh, to, to other citizens of another country. Uh, we, have no, we have not gotten any answer to that. Sabah al Mukhtar, the way uh, Kerry is representing the story brings to memory the Watergate uh, film, All the President's Men, when Deep Throat says, just follow the money. If we follow the money and find out what happened to these millions, in your opinion, where does it lead to? First of all, we, we need to look at the, at the possibility that, <coughs> that the, the Kurdish government at the present moment uh, what came into the light, this, this discovery came into the light because of the stock exchange in Norway. The Iraqi people have been complaining about this abuse of power and this corruption throughout the country, but they were accused of being Ba'athist and Saddamist and, and Qaeda and what have you. Then you have the stock exchange of Norway producing this small report about air company, which has been fined by the stock exchange, and here we have it becomes news. This is exactly where the problem lies with Horami accusing the, the newspaper of being the enemy. But in fact, it is only the disclosure of these facts that is embarrassing those politicians and the government there. And in fact, one would expect that any politician in the Kurdish region and indeed in Iraq would have to think twice as to who is actually running the show into that in, in that country, whether in the north or even in, in central Iraq, because everybody is on a corrupt scheme. They are all uh, uh, exchanging benefits for each other. Yes. The present moment, uh, the, the Kurdish government cannot account for the money it has taken. Final question, less than 15 seconds, Terry. Will you be continuing to cover the story? Absolutely. There is a lot of unanswered questions in the story, so we will keep on uh, reporting on it. Terry Arikstad, Sabah al Mukhtar, thank you for being guests on Inside Iraq. Thank you. Thank you. To watch the show online, please go to our website, aljazeera.net forward slash English. We have reached the end of this show. Join me next week when we take another look inside Iraq. Until then, have a great week.